Hey, Marty. Hello. Is that John Dreyfus behind that beard? <laughs> it's the uh, shelter in place, uh, shelter in face. <laughs> <laughs> looking good. Uh, definitely looking more Hemingway like by the day. I don't know if you guys all know each other. I mean, I don't know. I, I've met Kevin. This is Marty. Hi, I'm John. And nice to meet you, John. Nice to meet you. And John's the uh, architect uh, for the comfort station part of the uh, project. I thought he was a writer, John, <laughs> John Hemingway. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> Hello, you say pause. Is that Jeffrey trying to get on? Hello, Jeffrey. It says you're connecting to audio. Now it says you're muted. <laughs> there we go. Like, looks like you did it. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. My computer is being ornery. It, it thinks it's a Monday when really it's a Thursday. So, isn't every day kind of the same? <laughs> it what's is. A, what's a weekend like? I don't know. <laughs> that is isn't isn't that what the the grandmother says on Downton Abbey? What's a weekend? <laughs> um, sorry, I missed that phone call yesterday, Jeffrey and and Janine. I, my mess up. So uh, Terry, Terry Berger just joined also. She's the landscape architect for the project. Hi, Terry. Hi, nice to meet you all. Hey, Terry. See you again. Oh, I think probably saw some of you back in November. Yep. A few wow. things have changed since then. Yeah. Please tell me if you hear a lot of wind noise behind me, because I have various air cooling devices <laughs> going, going near me. Jeffrey, you are hearing us, yes? Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to be waiting for a quorum to get started. Hopefully, it's just a few more minutes. It's still before 6.30. Um, 
we'll run through protocols and introductions and all that stuff once the meeting gets started. Um, so thanks for being here this evening. Hi, Tina. Waving is good. <laughs> like the queen. <laughs> <laughs> So now we have a queen and a writer on, on, on this phone call. We have, we have the Queen of England and Hemingway. Our committee has grown a little bit. We have 15 members. So our quorum, I'm doing a count. Unless I can count Gwen twice, which I don't think I should. Good evening. Um, um, with one more, we can get started, but we'll give it another Alan, couple minutes. You, Alan, would you, yeah, good, thank you, you did. And in typical Zoom fashion, poof, we have a quorum. <laughs> um, I wanna pull up my notes in the agenda. Okay, um, good evening everyone. Um, welcome to the Waterfront Parks and Environment Committee of Community Board 4. Uh, my name is Jeffrey LaFrancois. I'm the co-chair this evening along with my other half and co-chair, uh, Marty Decat, waving his hand. Um, this is not our first go around on Zoom for this committee, nor I'm sure for any of us, but I just wanna go over a couple of um, the protocols and rules um, as we run through them this evening. Um, we would greatly appreciate it if everyone besides the speaker and the presenter stays muted throughout the meeting so as to prevent any feedback. Um, members of the public who have joined uh, through the online link um, can ask questions and if they need to make a brief statement um, after stuff has been done. Uh, we maintain these meetings um, as our typical process in which we have a presentation or a discussion on the given item on the agenda. The committee then has the right to ask questions and have a discussion. We then go to the public and then we bring it back to the committee for any uh, final points, perhaps the vote or discussions around a letter is taken. Um, if you're dialing in this evening, um, let's see, you need to raise your hand through the phone, you use the star nine function and to mute, you do star six. Um, I think that is the, uh, all the technicals of the evening. Um, Janine, you're gonna be uh, the driver's seat this evening for the presentation, correct? Yeah, I'll be putting it up. Just let me know when you're, whenever you're ready. Oh, I can. Maybe it's just me, I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it up now. Everybody else can hear Janine except for me? Yeah. Okay. Um, huh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, yes. call out names of the committee to introduce yourselves while I try to figure out why I can't hear anybody. Um, I will start with my co-chair. Marty, please say hello, um, and then kick it to somebody else on the committee, please. Hello. I did, I did exactly as you asked. Uh, let's go down the list. Uh, I'm the co-chair, happy to be. Uh, and when, as Jeffrey gets his sound so he can hear people, he will be chairing tonight's meeting. And the list I have is Gwen, are you there? Went to the top of my list. 
Gwen may not be hearing, and if she is, she'll cut in. How about Tina? Hi, I'm Tina DeFelice Antonio. Uh, Sally? I saw her before. Right there. Uh, she needs to unmute if she's going to speak. How about David? Hi, I'm Dave Haloka. Uh, th thank you, David. Uh, sorry, did you hear me when I spoke? No, just now is the first time I heard you. Okay, say. sorry. Yeah, I'm having trouble with this. I'm not home, so I'm having trouble, but I am on and I can hear you guys. Okay, but now you can hear me, right? Uh, we heard you loud and clear that time. Thank okay, you, sorry. Uh, say something about yourself. Oh, um, I'm a public member, Waterfront Park uh, and Environment. Thank you. Uh, Blake? Hi, Blake Caruso. Hi, Blake. You didn't say anything about yourself either. Never mind. Chris? <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Chris LeBron. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Jeffrey, you're going to speak in a while. Uh, Alan? And I, I can hear you, and I hope you can hear me now, too. Yes, we can. Uh, Sorry, Alan? Jeffrey, what was that? <laughs> that? Are you serious that you didn't hear him? Just kidding, I heard him. All right, that's what I was afraid of, Chris. Thanks for your help, man. Appreciate it. Alan? Alan Astor, good evening. Hi. Who did I miss who was on the committee? Leslie. <laughs> Leslie Bogosian Murphy, Hell's Kitchen resident. Good evening. <laughs> Hi, and Leslie. Sarah. Sarah Appleton, Chelsea resident. Sorry, Sarah, didn't see you. And I didn't see Leslie. So we do have I a quorum, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Marty. Um, all right, with that, we will move to the first item on our agenda, which is going to be a presentation from our friends at the Hudson River Park Trust regarding the Chelsea Waterside Park design progress. Uh, gosh, it's been, what, two, two to three months since we last heard on this, so looking forward to these updates. Kevin, are you going to be walking us through this today? I'm going to introduce it, uh, say a few words, and I'm going to turn it over to Terry Berger, who's a partner at Abel Baines and Butts Landscape Architects, Great. and uh, John Dreyfus from CDR Architects uh, will be presenting the building. So it's a okay. three-person three person job here. So, Take it away. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, a lot has happened, obviously, since uh, November when we, last, um, when we last met, but in regards to this project, uh, things are going pretty great. Um, I think you're going to like uh, the design uh, that you're going to see, but I also have some pretty good news um, in that thanks to Speaker Johnson, um, the replacement of the synthetic turf field is fully funded, so that is now officially part of the project. Um, so we are really happy about that. Um, and let me give you a little uh, talk on process. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, and then the next one. So just a brief uh, summary, we last met November uh, in 2019 uh, to give kind of an introduction of the team. That's when you met Abel Bainson and Butts for the first time. Uh, and then we also had a smaller uh, group um, with Mr. Oster and the uh, dog users uh, in March at my office just to get some thoughts on how the dog um, run could be improved. And then we've been having kind of random interactions with other people and gathering information and working with ABB um, quite a bit. And so it's all come together. So uh, next slide. And I just want to touch on some of the goals of the project. Um, you know, the trust, we're always interested in sustainability. Um, so we wanted to, for this project, increase the native plantings there. Uh, we wanted to buffer the West Side Highway, make it a nicer place. We definitely want to reuse a lot of the materials that are currently in place. There's an awful lot of granite, a lot of like great materials that we think we can reuse in the new in the new design. Um, we want to look at some green features for the comfort station that you'll be seeing, some green roofs and uh, photovoltaics. Um, and we also need to respect uh, the flooding situation because, uh, of course, we're right on the river, so we got to be cognizant of that. So the um, the main design goals uh, for the project, we want to reconfigure the park because we just feel, and we've heard this from a lot of people, that the park is really more of a pass-through park. 
Um, it's a, a it's a place where people cut through to get to the main park. And we feel that's a missed opportunity and we'd really like to develop this park into a proper uh, kind of park in itself. So we would be creating a more of a inward focused park that you can go and relax. Uh, there'll be a new comfort station, a picnic area. Uh, the overlook area will be um, absorbed by the synthetic turf field area so that it's, it's actually used. Um, a, center, a central um, flexible area with grass that you can lay down, sunbathe, picnic there. Uh, we're gonna, in response to some of the community members who I met after we opened the playground, we're gonna do a better job with the stroller parking and integrate some, some formal stroller parking uh, actually inside the playground. And we're gonna just increase the planting quite a bit and decrease the pavement quite a bit. And then we'll also be uh, enhancing the dog run, basically making two dog runs, one for big dogs, one for small dogs, um, and, and just increasing the size to accommodate both of those um, dog runs. Um, and I think with that, I'd like to turn it over to Terry who can actually walk you through the design based on those goals. So, uh, next slide and Terry, take it away. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So this is just to show you where we are. Um, so we're meeting today in the orange space. Um, and from this point, um, incorporating whatever feedback input we get from you today, we're gonna move on then to design development we anticipate having another meeting with you following that. And then we're going to be moving into construction documentation, bidding award, construction, and then towards the park opening. At the moment, we've been talking with the trust um, about probably a, a spring 2021 start date for construction is what um, we're looking for. And we think that's achievable at this point. Uh, next slide, please. Let me just say when we, um, the next time we come back, I'm sure everybody, uh, we know we want to start in the spring. We think we can do it. And everybody I'm sure is interested in how long this is going to take and what's going to be closed while we do construction and whatnot. When we come back uh, the next time, we'll have a construction phasing schedule and be a lot more clear on how long things are going to take and in what areas will be under construction. We want to be sure we have the design right before we actually be particular about scheduling it. So just wanted to say that. So. Continue, Terry, please. Thank you. So the next few slides um, really document some of the significant findings that we've had um, and that are going to continue to inform the design as we progress it. Next slide, please. So this really documents just our understanding of the park in context of the other public open spaces and recreational areas. You all know your park very well. I don't need to go into the details of this, but for us, it's just informative to see what the other amenities, other public open spaces are, um, you know, within a, a reasonable radius of this park. Next slide. So as um, Kevin mentioned, obviously, for the um, P firm maps or the FEMA maps, the site is wholly within um, the A zone, the 100 year flood zone. And, um, what that really means is that we have to be very cognizant of how we design the park um, so that we're taking into consideration issues associated, associated with potential flooding, but very specifically, we have to consider um, building code requirements, um, make sure that they are met for the comfort station, um, which requires us to be above the base flood elevation, which is set by the, um, the FEMA maps, and when John Dreyfus goes into his presentation on the comfort station, he'll, he'll touch on this and explain it a bit more for you. Next slide, please. So this really just identifies the major program elements that exist right now um, in the existing uh, park. Um, again, you all know it very well. It also identifies what the limits of this project are with the dashed orange line. So within the dashed orange, orange line, um, that is our work area for this project. Next. So this is one of our site analysis slides. Um, I think the, the important thing of note um, really to mention here is obviously the impact that the West Side Highway Route 9A 
has on this site, particularly with regards to the, the southern area of the site where currently programming is, is very, very close um, to the edge of the highway. Um, so that's something that we're going to be considering um, as we develop the design. And the other very important thing is that right through the middle of the site, uh, there is a DEP sewer. Now, we have to just be cognizant of that. Um, as we develop the design, it, it certainly was important to us when we were considering the siting of the comfort station. We didn't want to be over that sewer line because DEP does have uh, jurisdiction over that. Now, it's not going to impact us in a big way otherwise because it is quite deep, but it's just one of those things that we have to um, contend with. Next, please. Uh, this slide just indicates by color, um, yellow being the highest portion of the site and the coolest colors being the lowest portion of the site um, as it exists right now. So you start to see, or, and we started to see that there were some um, very clear indicators as to where the appropriate siting for the conversation was relative to both uh, proximity to program elements, as well as the elevation or topography within the site. Next. So this was the tree analysis that we did. Um, we identified all of the existing trees and preliminarily reviewed their condition. We've identified several trees that were uh, subsequent to starting the project that the trust took down because of their condition. They actually were dead. They were several columnar trees near the um, sports field um, that had to come down. And in the dog run area, there's one tree that is not in good health that we're recommending come down. And then there's one other tree that we're recommending come, uh, be taken down for uh, design reasons. And you'll see why that is when you see the design. Um, and then up at the uh, overlook, there are three um, believe they're Laetitia's um, honey locusts, which uh, as that becomes more field area, those will have to come down as well. Next slide, please. And this slide um, really <clears throat> sort of distills what the considerations were that we had as a result of sort of the inventory and the input that we got from both the trust and from the community. So if you start at the lower left of the, of the screen, um, priority to expand the, the dog run. Take a look at how do you reconfigure that main thoroughfare, um, reconfigure the circulation, have better sight lines for crossing uh, purposes when you get to the highway. Uh, take a look at the relationship and, and the proximity of where the new picnic area should be and what's the right location for the comfort station, as well as how do we repurpose that overlook area. Next. Uh, these photos really just document what the existing conditions are. Um, you know, the central path, as Kevin alluded to, it feels more like, a, a, makes the park feel more like a pass-through um, and, and less like a destination. Um, the central planting on the right, um, there is some lovely ornamental material there, and that's something that we want to take a cue from when we develop our planting. On the lower left, there are existing benches, which we think the supports for, which are stainless steel, may have um, potential for reuse um, with you know, new bench uh, seats and backs, and we're going to look at ways to repurpose those kinds of things. Next. Um, dog run in the upper left corner, um, there in, in our conversations with the community, there were lots of things about the dog run that did work um, and things that the dogs take advantage of, like the mounds, like the boulders. Um, and then there were things that didn't work so well, like the water situation, the seeding. Um, and so we, we're going to incorporate what works and look for other ways to address the things that aren't working. 
um, on the upper right side of the seating step. Again, as Kevin mentioned, this area due to its elevation is really disconnected from the rest of the park. Um, and it, although these are intended for like seating and I assume spectator seating, they aren't the greatest position or not the most appropriate position for viewing the sports field. They are, there is, however, some material here that's a potential for reuse, and we will look to reuse by planning. Um, the lower right, again, the overlook area, which is elevated, and you'll see as part of the design, we look at how we can change the, the elevation of that to be more on the same elevation as the rest of the park. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an analysis of uh, sun and shade studies that we did. Uh, we were primarily interested in seeing how the new building that was being built, um, which by now maybe is, I don't know, by now maybe it's complete. Um, I don't know what their situation was during this, um, but this sun uh, shade study does take that into consideration. So you can see that um, that we've got good sun exposure for the prime seasons um, when the park would be used. Next. Uh, this is a relational diagram really uh, for us and uh, based on input that we got from you and the trust about the spatial relationships of the program elements where should certain things be adjacent to other things and how do they relate to one another. So for example, the picnic seating area really needed to have a strong spatial relationship to the playground um, and, and to the conversation as well as the synthetic turf field needed to have a strong relationship to the conversation also. Next. Okay, so now we're really gonna get into the heart of it here, which is our um, proposed concept design. Next. So although a little screen back here so you can see what the program elements are, um, this is our proposed concept design for the park redevelopment, which I'm gonna take you through in the next several slides. Um, this identifies both the new programming and the enhanced, enhanced programming and their uses. As you can see, the design incorporates a more organic, curvilinear approach to the circulation, um, eliminating that very dominant through route that divided the park uh, in favor of, uh, in favor of a, a meander through the park, which strengthens the overall spatial cohesiveness of the park, but also offers more contiguous green usable spaces and contiguous planting uh, spaces. So <clears throat> the design is intended to deliver a new open space that's really more park-like and less closet-like. That was um, something that we heard a lot in the early part of the design efforts. Um, so let's just run through quickly the program areas. So again, dog run, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Main entry space off of 11. We have the central lawn area with main circulation through it. So there is still a pretty direct route to come from 11th Avenue, go through the park and exit at the West Side Highway at the same location where you enter and leave the park currently. Um, within that major central lawn area is a new picnic area. And then to the right of that picnic area is a secondary pathway, um, which takes you to the synthetic turf field area, um, bypassing and giving you access to the playground, and then also the comfort station. Next. And there you go, you get to see it in full color. Um, what this um, slide does is it really, besides showing you the overall plan and the relationships of all of the elements together, if you see there are some red dashed lines on this plan. And um, that really indicates what the previous or existing 
limits of those program areas were previously. So you get to see how we're modifying and or expanding those areas. So lower left or south end of the site where we have the dog run, you can see that it's getting expanded quite a lot from where it was previously. Um, over to the right, the playground area. Um, if you look at the south edge of the playground or plan left portion of the playground, we're not really touching the playground very much. We're really just affecting that front edge of the playground um, in part to do two things. One is to um, provide enough space so that we can get organized and defined stroller parking in adjacent to the entrance, but it also gives us a little breathing room so that we can um, include some nicer fencing um, at the front and along the side of the playground. Uh, right now it's a chain link fence, I think, and we're looking to potentially upgrade that fencing. And then if you shift up um, north and west to the sports field, you start to see where the limits of the sports field were previously. And you can see now how we're starting to incorporate um, the overlook area uh, to a space that, you know, then becomes contiguous with the field um, at the same elevation and offers the opportunity for a new practice area. Um, you can see over to the left are the, the increases in actual size. Um, the dog run combined is, um, is nearly double. Um, between the, the large and the small dog areas is now double what the size of the existing dog run was. And the synthetic turf field, although we are see right at the lower left corner of the sports field where the location that's the location of the comfort station which we'll get into although we're taking away a little bit of space there from the from the sports field we're actually increasing the overall size of the synthetic turf area even though we're feeling that corner there by adding the overlook area um, and, uh, just to jump in just to say the um, the striping shown here is what it currently is. We're going to go back to the ball field user groups and see if this striping makes sense. We, we, haven't, we haven't done anything about that yet. So this is a placeholder. Great. Thanks, Kevin, for clarifying that. Um, and then the picnic area is in the order of 2,000 square feet and the, that central lawn area adjacent to the picnic area, which is the light green color there, um, that's about 4,000 square feet. Next slide. So this just really highlights what the circulation is through the park. So the, the heavier blue line, the major circulation that I talked about previously, the red is the secondary circulation. Um, it's worth noting that all of the access points into the park will remain. We're not, we're not reducing those at all. Um, and that access into the dog run is increased. So we're essentially maintaining the existing access into the dog run at the southernmost end. We're adding another entrance which, which gets you into the small dog run and access to the large dog run that's a bit north on 11th Avenue. And then within the park um, on the west side, the northernmost end of the dog run, uh, you have another access point which gives you access to both the large dog run and the um, small dog run. And maybe also, um, oh, you'll, yeah. you'll see in more detail, but the comfort station is configured in a way that you can pass through it. So that is actually the formal entrance into the synthetic turf area. It's tough to see in this plan, but you'll, you'll understand a little, long, a little down the road here. Okay, next. Okay, so let's get you a little closer to what's going on um, and you can see a little bit of the, of the nuance of the design program areas and how they really relate to one another. Um, we're gonna dive into the dog run area and the comfort station a little bit more and you'll see some three-dimensional um, sketches of the picnic area as well. Um, so I think the thing that's really important to note here is 
So on the main circulation path, we do have seating along um, the southern edges of that. Um, when you arrive and enter the park on 11th Avenue, you, you really have a view across um, the landscape. Um, there's some landform there at the front of that central green space, which um, we're, we're looking at that number 14, which says planted burn. You see there's a little bit of a sculpted landform there, and we're looking at having that be um, more of an ornamental um, type of planting. So um, you're looking over that and looking beyond that into the bigger landscape. Um, we're, as I said, we're going to get into detail with the, the other areas, so I won't talk about them right now, but um, as Kevin said, you can see that secondary uh, pathway that goes to the right of the central green space and past the playground. Um, if you take a look at where the number two is, that gets us, there's um, an ADA accessible route that gets us up to the comfort station, and as Kevin mentioned, and you'll see a little bit more clearly that you go through this um, the building configuration as your gateway to the synthetic turf field. Uh, the, sorry, Terry, but I, just to jump in one more time. Um, also worth mentioning, I think, is that if you look at uh, number 10, which is just off the entrance of the 11th Avenue entrance of the park, that's an area that we're setting aside for a future concession kiosk, which would serve like coffee, non-alcoholic drinks, pre-made sandwiches. And it's about an eight, eight foot by 12 foot box. Um, that is not the, the concession itself is not part of this design um, team's effort. Uh, we would RFP that later with a, to, to get a concessionaire. And I, I'm pretty sure you, you guys have experience with how this works. We would, reach out to a concessionaire, get somebody and then work with them to design that box. Uh, but that's kind of the placeholder for it. And I think it's important for you to know where we anticipate putting that. So, okay, Terry. Okay, thanks. Yep, uh, next. So this gives you a little bit of a, an aerial view of the space and dog run on the left, all the way to the left, number eight is the large dog run area. Uh, just north of that, number nine is the small dog run area. As you can see, there's buffer planting in between the dog runs and the central area of the park. We've got a big green space in the center of the park and within that green space, the picnic area just opposite the playground. Um, um, we're anticipating a, some level of tree canopy uh, within that picnic area to provide shade. And then I think this starts to give you a good sense of how the comfort station fits into the overall spaces within the park. Uh, just a little vignette of the picnic area. So um, start to see that we've got this tree canopy. Um, we're creating this central zone that is a little bit protected. We're looking at doing seat walls around the two sides um, in order to do a couple things. Um, one, that's to help us adjust some of the, of the topography within the site. Uh, because we really do want to, um, we need to be very cognizant of how circulation is working. And some of the, the topography changes that we're doing is to help us direct circulation through the park in a way that will um, help the landscape to be sustainable and help these areas to be better defined. Uh, you start to see that this is a place where we're going to do some specialty lighting. Um, one of the ideas we have is to do this sort of festoon lighting um, that would be strong above and probably some under lights in the, in the seat walls. And um, also worth mentioning that uh, the, the furniture is also kind of a placeholder. Um, we, we haven't selected furniture at all for this, 
Um, so I, when it comes time for the, the members of the community board to, to offer comments and whatnot, I, I'd definitely be interested in hearing your thoughts on what type of furniture you would see here and do you like picnic tables and, and that type of things. So please yeah. put that in your brain for, for later. Yeah, no, that's really good, Kevin. We would like to hear feedback about that. Because um, one of our thoughts was um, to include picnic tables, uh, some that are smaller length, but we also have this idea of doing a bigger community, like a harvest table that's a bit longer, that would accommodate sort of bigger gatherings. Um, so we'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts are on that for sure. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the dog run. Next slide. Okay, so in a little bit more detail, I had alluded to, we've divided up this space into large dog on the south, smaller dog area on the north, um, separating the two, we're anticipating reusing some of the tapered granite walls that exist, uh, repurposing them, and then we're actually using that wall to help define and separate a water feature, one for each side um, of the dog run, uh, kind of analogous to some of the other water spray dog pool areas that you have. Um, we're thinking there can be ground sprays and potentially some sprays off the wall. Um, and we're also looking at creating some blocks in that, so um, to give a little bit more play value within the, um, the spray basins. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there were certain things that we know were really liked about the existing dog run, and one of those things is the mounds and the boulders. So we're looking to incorporate a similar kind of feature. Um, another element that you see identified as number one is this tiered seating. So that gives um, bog owners or the two-legged, if you're a fan of Pluto online, you'll know that expression, the two-legged and the four-legged. Um, anyway, the two-legged, uh, a chance to get up out of the fray, uh, but it's also a place where the dogs could, you know, can jump up and, and play and get a higher vantage point as well. Um, we will be creating protection around the trees, um, similar but different to what you have now, the wicked fence you have. We're looking at doing something that's a little bit more substantial. Um, when we met with the dog user groups, um, we took back the comments about making sure that feeding that we were providing was directed in the right orientation so that there were good sight lines from those feeding locations across the dog runs. Um, so to help uh, reinforce the dog users uh, monitoring their dogs. So I think we've effectively done that. In addition to the tiered seating, there are some other seats at the edges, but all of the seating is facing inward. It's all directed towards um, sort of the usable play spaces uh, within the dog runs. Um, all of the entries into the dog run are the, the double gates or the sally port type um, entries. And um, fencing here will be all new. We're looking at doing, in some locations, particularly where we have the tiered seating, we have to do fencing that is a bit higher. And we will be looking at um, potentially developing some some decorative features um, within those fences, probably associated with the tiered seating as we get further into the development of the design. Um, just one last thing to talk about the amenities. Um, we, we will be providing a drinking fountain with dog bowls. There will be trash receptacles. See on the left side, there's a list of um, um, amenities that, that we will be including. Um, we know that you, there's a, a hose reel and box that's utilized in the playground that seems very effective and we're looking at having a similar kind of setup here um, so that this becomes a, a space that's easy um, for everyone to maintain. Next slide. And then this is just a very, very preliminary um, vignette. Um, we, we've got a long way to go here. 
Um, but you just, you start to get the idea of the elevated seeding and how that relates to the existing trees that we're going to be preserving. Next. Furnishings that we talked about with the dog user group, um, and I think I've pretty much mentioned uh, all of them previously. Next slide. Thanks. Um, and then these were some precedents um, that we were looking to uh, for sort of experientially, but also um, surfaces and the idea that we think there's an opportunity to incorporate some really fun graphics. Um, so that's going to be the next level of our development um, as we go forward is you know, how we get some of this more detailed, these more uh, detailed elements um, into mine at this point. But we think that we're going to be able to do some fun paving treatments and um, other fun elements within the dog run in addition to what we've already talked about. Next. Okay, so we're going to talk about the comfort station now, and I'm going to turn it over to John Frazier. Hi, uh, thanks everyone. Um, we're, we're looking forward to getting comments and feedback. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. Uh, this is just a view of, of the approach from the park side and um, more specifically from um, kind of the trajectory along the playground. Uh, the playground. Uh, if we could have the next slide to go into a little more detail. So on the left-hand side, you see the site plan. And one of our first moves was to pull the two bathrooms apart to create what Kevin was speaking about, the, the gateway, which can be secured with a side coiling grill um, that frames the entrance to the play playing field, but also flame, uh, connects the playing field more directly to the park in general. Um, and then another key uh, design uh, consideration is just uh, clear visibility from both sides of the comfort station, and especially from the playground and the picnic area. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the plan on the left shows the women's bathroom is on the upper left, the men's bathroom on the right. Uh, there's a box area for the side cooling grill, which we think will be easy to uh, maintain and uh, easy to use. Uh, all these elements, including the mechanical room, are lifted above the floodplain. Um, and then the mechanical area to the, on the lower right is at the level, lower level for easy access for the park uh, employees. Um, also above the mechanical, I mean, sorry, the uh, maintenance storage is a mechanical well to conceal any kind of units that, uh, for heating and cooling. Um, the the uh, plan is situated along the points of intersection of the two fences which are existing and it nestles in in the southeast corner of the playing field. Um, we also have bleacher seating for putting on, taking off cleats um, uh, or soccer shoes uh, on the field side and um, and then next slide, please. Uh, and sustainability has been a very key factor in the way we're thinking about this project. Uh, we have incorporated solar panels, which have a double function of creating sunshade and um, you know, ever-changing shadow play on the cladding and the ground surface between, between the two little buildings. Uh, also, we have a, a bermed grass roof, which has a function of uh, protecting the solar panels from errant soccer balls. We do think it's pretty far away from the playing field, but we just want to make sure there's kind of a buffer uh, between that activity and, and the panels. Uh, the entrances are clad in weathered steel, um, something warm, we think, and durable. And uh, we think that the ladies' room, sorry, the women's room um, could have a bulletin board for community events uh, if that's desired. Uh, we have clear story windows for natural light, and um, we, we're excited about the possibility and we consulted with a masonry consultant um, to reuse the granite uh, knee walls uh, of the existing park to cut them and reconfigure them to give a, uh, I think an attractive cladding but also as importantly a very durable um, durable one at that so I think with that uh, yeah we welcome questions and comments 
Thank you very much for that. Um, as our protocol, we'll start with the committee um, and go around from there. If everybody could use the raised hand feature, as expected, uh, Mr. Oster with his hand up first. And then Janine, I know um, Saz Eleven is here, Chelsea Waterside Park Association. Maybe if we wanna bring her over, certainly wanna welcome her into the conversation as well. Um, Alan, if you wanna kick us off. Alan, are you there? If I'm not, there. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank there you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Terry, uh, Kevin, John. Um, thank you very much. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, and I want to compliment you for coming in on time. As you said, you'd be back June, July, and here you are. And I think uh, that says a lot to the whole team. Um, I'll, I'll take the, the landscaping in the, in the northern part of the south, uh, northern part of the section. I think it all lays out very nicely. Uh, the comfort station, the overlook, the meandering, and I'm sure, you know, down the road we'll have a chance to talk about more about maybe the seating and everything else going on. But I think the, the general picture of it uh, looks real good in terms of making it more interesting um, and keeping people in the park rather than just, as you said, just as a pass-through. Um, my question in the picnic area, um, is there shading there now that you're working with? Are those trees there now? or will you need new trees or will uh, the folks in the park need to put umbrellas in the furniture for shading uh, until things grow in? So those will be new trees. Um, and we are anticipating and have been talking about trying to source some larger trees to go in just that particular area. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's important that, you know, they, they have a little bit of a head start because you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we want to we want to have some shade, and we want to have that sort of sense of canopy and enclosure uh, right at the beginning. So we were successful in doing that at another project where we created a picnic area that's not terribly dissimilar from this, and we were able to um, install, and they've done quite well over the past 15 years um, of installing the large large trees. Uh, thank you. So we'll, sh we'll shift down to the main focus uh, for uh, a lot of folks in, in, in the audience and the dog run. Um, are, are you taking down the existing mounds and putting in new mounds? Or are you working with the mounds that are existing now? We're anticipating taking everything down. And, and the, the only thing that we're really thinking we're keeping is there is an existing concrete wall at the edge along Route 9A. We're envisioning keeping that, um, you know, sprucing it up, reworking things with it, and then taking everything else down, maintaining those large trees, and starting fresh. So the mounds will be new, um, so we can adjust them to be however, you know, works best. Um, you know, we already got some feedback from the dog user groups about what works and what didn't. Some are too high, some, are, some aren't high enough. And I think the separation of the, of the large and small dogs will help us sort of, you know, manipulate those heights appropriately. Because yeah, yeah. my concern right now between the bench and the mounds is only about four feet uh, of runway of, of asphalt. Uh, so um, looking at the, um, the, the, the the design, it looks like you've got more space between the, the, the new seating and the mound, which is a good thing because it gets kind of crowded if the dogs are in about a four foot uh, space that, that's in there now. Um, personally, I'm not, I'm not a great fan of stadium seating. Um, I think it could be a problem with dogs going up and down, falling, uh, that sort of thing. Um, there might be people who want to be sitting there and not want to be bothered by uh, someone else's dog, kind of like running up the step, you know, all those steps. So, I mean, that's something uh, the, the dog owners could, could um, chime in on uh, going forward. Uh, can you tell me what the, what, what the projected new space is going to be from what the, ex the northern end of the dog run now, what the expansion is going north before you go into the, the small dog area? 
I mean, right now, you, it, it's about 82 feet from the north end to the corner to the south end, approximately. So can you, so it gives me a better idea, a better feel of how much more space we're getting um, from what, what uh, in terms of incorporating into the, into the larger dog run. Okay, I, I can tell that David in, from my office is, is measuring right now, so he's going to tell you in one <laughs> second, okay? It's, it's about 130 feet um, from that corner of West Side Highway and 11th Avenue to the outer edge um, of the small dog run. And then you have that planted buffer between the small dog run and then the main circulation of the park. Okay, all right, all right. that's good space, good space. Uh, so I think when we met um, back in March, um, I, I think most, most of the folks, uh, I, I won't speak for most of them, but I think that there, there's a perception that you really need a small dog run because all the do small dog owners are gonna go there and that would probably be the case if this was a new dog run. Um, right now, everybody's in there and the small dogs have big dog friends and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, I think the small dog area um, might be scaled back somewhat to give the larger area some more space because the people, some of these folks have large dogs and a small dog. And uh, the folks who've been using these dog runs for the last X number of years have been bringing the small dogs into this space. So if this was a new dog run from scratch and you set up space, the, dog, the small dog people would, would gravitate to a small dog area. But, you know, you know I'm sorry, I think we, we sort of talked a little bit about the, the camaraderie in terms of, of the folks who are using the dog run now. Uh, so that might be something to look at in terms of maybe giving more space to the larger area uh, at some point. So um, um, uh, in, in that sense, um, again, I think it's a wonderful design. I think uh, considering the shape of, the, of this space, it's not a rectangle, it's not a square. Um, I think you did a good job in, in, in reconforming, <coughs> reconfiguring <coughs> um, um, the, the, the issues there. Um, and I'll just um, pass, pass my mic on to someone else at this point, but thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Blake. Thank you for the presentation. You know, I want to echo Alan's uh, thanks and, um, you know, appreciate the incorporation of the feedback. Uh, so just a couple of thoughts. One is, um, you know, I was interested in the east side of the uh, meandering path uh, that's um, you know, now the path is more of a functional walkway from one side to the other. And I love the idea that it's becoming more of a, you know, meandering, more of a park feel. I would just want to think through the um, plantings that are on the east side of the um, space in the middle, just so that we don't get a situation where people are continuing to walk straight through uh, and creating, you know, like an area in the grass that's trodden. And, um, you know, if they continue to use it in the same way that it's being used currently. Um, the second thought is, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the bathroom area, the comfort station, I should say, uh, being the kind of gateway into the playing field area. And I think, you know, in, in the concept drawings, it really um, looks great. And, you know, I think at the outset, it will be really nice. I would just want to make sure that um, even as, you know, the maintenance is um, maybe to a varying degree upkept uh, of that comfort station, that it's still you know, a, a nice entrance point into the playing field. And so, you know, if we are keeping it as kind of that gateway into the playing field area, you know, I'd want to do what we can architecturally to make it easy to upkeep, you know, for example, um, you know, maybe letting more light through uh, the ceiling or, you know, just making that space feel a little, um, you know, more like a public um, opening rather that's welcoming rather than, you know, like a, a, a bathroom, um, a bathroom space. Um, and the third thought was just on the, um, the furniture, which, you know, I know you asked about. Um, I think my preference would be for, um, you know, picnic type tables with individual chairs, just to discourage, you know, folks from taking up more than one seat by uh, using it as a place to lay down. So thank you again. Those are good comments. Thank you, Blake. Uh, Leslie? 
Okay, hi guys. Um, Terry and John, this might be a little bit of a love fest. That was amazing. I, I think it's really thoughtful, really. I, I, I think uh, I think the comfort station is thoughtful. I think the stroller parking is thoughtful. You even have um, entrances on 24th Street right directly to the field. So when we pull up with our huge soccer goals and all of our bags, we can just dump them right there into the field. I thought that that was great. Um, I like that there, uh, I think the Northwest part of the field is you just, there's nothing there, it's empty, which I like too. That's really thoughtful because when teams are waiting or families are there for their turn, uh, I think you don't have to fill up every little space. People can kind of congregate there. And I thought that was great. Um, uh, there were, oh, a, a few things. I do agree with Blake that maybe as nice as the comfort station is, it shouldn't be the only gateway into the field because then people will trek back and forth, back and forth through that. Kids will be running. Um, if it was just over to the side and there was a separate entrance way, it, it might be a little better flow. Um, and Jeffrey, you're going you're gonna to love this. Where are the bike racks? It's a right, great Jeffrey? question, Leslie. Thank you. <laughs> Bike rack, like just, if there's somewhere for bike racks, I think, so people can just, um, and they can park their bikes inside the park. I think that would be helpful. Um, and I just had one more question about the solar panels. Was that just to power the comfort station or are there going to be night lights for night field play? Or I wasn't sure how far the solar um, uh, activity was going. What I'm hoping to do is similar to in my prior life when I worked on Washington Square Park, the solar panels on the roof of that building, it's a net metering arrangement. So as much juice as those panels put out during the day, it will go into the general grid of the city. And then at night, we'll pull off of the grid to power the lights. And that's I mean, is it, is it a possibility that, that, that the, the plans you have for the solar panels in that limited space could power the lights of that park full time? Or I, I'm not just I don't know the metrics that well. Yeah, so probably probably not. And the other issue with doing that is that you need a bit more infrastructure um, because if you're going to use it right, if you're going to use it, you need to have your own um, inverters. You need to have your own storage, like battery storage on site right. to be able to do that. So doing it this way, as Kevin is suggesting, um, is a um, sort of much friendlier, easier way um, to do it. Uh, much more sustainable, actually, I think, you know? Um, we've done it both ways on projects. Um, and in the future, um, we happen to have like our electrical engineer talk a little bit about it because he's got more experience with it. Um, One thing we could do is take, take a look at the math, you know? How much power we use versus how much the panels produce. It may not necessarily feed them at the at the same time or whatever, but overall net, we'd like to reduce our our draw as, as to, to yeah. zero as possible. But, yeah. So okay, I'll, yeah. I'll look at the math on that. That would be great. Um, and if you are taking comments or suggestions about picnic table, the big long harvest table is great because when we're done with our soccer games or whatever, the kids are going to go and we're going to all eat together. Um, Hopefully, when this is all over with, we'll all eat together. <laughs> but a big table, um, one of them would be nice. Thank you. Really, guys, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. David Haloka? Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I have a few thoughts. Um, uh, I uh, agree with Blake that it might be nice to have movable seating um, in the picnic area rather than benches. Um, recently, I've been um, um, sitting at the tables in Madison uh, Square, which are very nice. And I noticed the chairs are very heavy. I don't know if there are any movable chairs in the Hudson uh, River Park. Uh, but the ones in um, Madison are, they're so heavy that it would just be exhausting to try to steal one. <laughs> but it's very nice if you can actually kind of create your own seating area. And uh, the harvest table sounds great, but, you know, for more intimate uh, groups of people, it would be nice to have smaller tables. I'm wondering if it would make sense to create sort of a shade canopy in there as well uh, that might also hold uh, solar collectors. 
Um, and speaking of the solar collectors, I, it seems to me like the ones on the roof of the comfort station, um, along with the green roof and the different materials, uh, it just feels like there are a lot of parts there. And uh, maybe the sum of the parts isn't uh, a whole bit greater than, uh, than the parts themselves. I realize you're still going into design development, but I think uh, maybe that could work together better. And I'm wondering also if it seems like there's a fair amount of space there. If you might not, instead of having doors to the men's and women's rooms, uh, have uh, vision locks, you know, more circuitous routes in so that people don't actually have to touch a door to go through and they might feel safer once inside. Um, of course, there would be doors at some point to lock the things up at night, but they would stand open otherwise. Um, and I wonder if you actually need steps outside that uh, the comfort station. Uh, uh, presumably, you've got a path of like uh, a slope of 5% or less for the ADA access. Um, you know, it, could you simply eliminate the steps in the interest of having universal design access and maybe have that uh, the area where the steps are given over to planting, it would be a little less to maintain in the winter, less of a, a hazard. Um, I also, uh, you know, noticed the water feature in the dog run. Could there be one on the, the uh, maybe the picnic area as well? Given the proximity of the highway, uh, a water feature that created some noise might uh, distract from the noise of the highway. Uh, just a thought about that. Um, and uh, uh, the garland of lights, I think, is a really nice idea. Going back to uh, Madison Square, the area around uh, uh, Shake Shack. It's a very simple thing, but it, it creates a really kind of uh, elegant outdoor space, especially in the evening to sit. And uh, is there any chance that uh, our food concession could be a Shake Shack? <laughs> so those Thank are my you, David. I second. I second that. <laughs> I don't know that Shake Shack would want a 12 by 8 space. <laughs> um, and then how much line could fit, you know, around the new proposal. Um, Mr. Co-Chair, Marty. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I want a third, fourth, and fifth. I, I think it's a lovely design. Thank you for your work. Um, I'm going to start with my most difficult question. Uh, in, in this period of, of COVID, which I don't think is going to end all that quickly, have you considered a design that would accommodate social distancing in a space like this. And then I have two more questions. Um, maybe I can. Kevin, yeah, Kevin or Terry, I'm not sure. Generally speaking. I um, sort of expect the answer to be no, because nobody's doing that yet. Uh, yeah. We haven't considered social distancing, but uh, my my gut says we're going to be social distancing for quite a while, and I'm I'm just wondering if you all who do this design work I'm not a designer right. have thought that something like the ability for a park to permit social distancing with relative ease might be something that should be at least thought about in the design of this space. Well, I can say that um, we are prevent, providing opportunities for it, for sure. You know, there's a lot of space. Uh, the benches are, are well spaced. You can, you can choose to sit with somebody on the bench or you can, or can choose not to. Um, when it comes to the comfort station, which is kind of a key touch point for people, we're gonna design it so you can get in and out without touching stuff. The, the door comment raised by David earlier is a really good one, uh, but the fixtures, everything will be will be touchless motion sensor type arrangements. And, you know, synthetic turf field is, it is what it is. We can allow density or it's, you know, it's hard, it's hard to design a field to allow for social, to, to force social distancing. Um, but there's no dense clusters. I guess maybe um, I'm fumbling for my words because it's a really good question. Um, and I think in particular, the picnic area, we should probably take a hard look at that. But the rest of the park I think is pretty, easily um, spaced. So I think we can accommodate it as we have in the rest of the park operationally. Um, we're certainly not doing anything that, that prevents social distancing, let's put it that way. 
if you have any well, thank particular you. ideas, I'd love to. I'd love to hear them. Well, I'm I'm as new to COVID as the rest of you, uh, and uh, I'm not a I'm not a designer. So, uh, but I my gut says that you you as designers are stuck with thinking about this for quite a while to come, uh, and that's why I raised the question. Um, the other two questions I have uh, are: Is it really necessary to take down those trees? That's one, and two. Sort of following up on what uh, David uh, was talking about a minute ago: um, Is there? Have, are you going to do the math on maximizing uh, the power that you get from the solar collectors, and maybe taking over the green roof space and covering that as well, and thinking of green uh, the the solar house in Starlight Park in the Bronx, the Bronx River Alliance's house has siding that's using green lines to keep the building itself cool. Um, and that would not be a good place for solar collectors, but the roof certainly is a good place for solar collectors. So there may be some more juggling to be done in that. So I can take the tree question. Um, so the I think it is um, it is absolutely necessary to take the trees and carry it down for the reprogramming, obviously. And I think it is prudent to take the tree down, the one tree down in the dog run, which is not in good condition. The second, the second tree in the dog run, um, the reason we're taking that down is because of the location. And it was, I'm pretty sure it was either right in the location or very near the location of the, the water play area for the dog. And we picked that spot because it was sort of the sunniest spot. Um, you know, as you know, that area is, is well canopied. Um, so it, we felt that that water play area really needed to have some sun exposure. So that said, the, those trees are, that one tree is pretty mature. Um, and we are looking to, we will be far exceeding like the replacement um, value or size of those trees that we're taking out with new trees that we would be installing. So although we're taking, you know, we're taking that one tree out, which you could, that's the only one that I would say is maybe questionable um, in terms of removal, um, but, we're going to be, as I said, you know, installing new trees that are going to well exceed what we're, you know, removing in terms of, in terms of um, the actual size of the tree. Well, I certainly agree that a tree that is um, not as sound as it should be might be taken out, and this is a good opportunity to do it. Mature trees are uh, kind of valuable, and I'm sorry to see one go, and I hope you can figure out a way to think around that. Um, I can speak to the, the um, solar panel question. Um, we did look at options where we did total coverage. Uh, there is There was concern expressed about um, the proximity to the playing field with all the panels, and so that's why we were trying to make a berm buffer so balls could roll off um, back onto the field. So, But we definitely explored adding more panels if that's something that um, is decided to um, explore further. I think one other thing um, worth noting in terms of lighting is we are looking at taking the existing sports field lighting and converting that to LED. So that will give you some energy efficiency. And I'm not sure if Terry touched on this, but we are proposing LED pedestrian scale lighting throughout the park to match the playground as well. So. While the solar panel effort um, is there, we're looking at other ways to, you know, improve the environmental integrity of the project. Which is to say that any energy you use will be used in the most efficient way that you can, LED being one of those choices. Um, um, thank you. Um, I have just two comments and then I'm going to kick it over. That'll to see if she has anything. And I know we have a question in the Q&A regarding the dog run, which I will read through um, in just a second. Um, I recognize um, and I've come to understand the concerns around the bathroom and the gateway to the uh, field. I wonder if you can tell us how wide um, it is 
uh, if you're to walk through there, what the width is between the men's and the women's room, um, just spatially to understand if that is a gateway and it is something that's kept, how wide is it? I, I appreciate this design tremendously because there's a beauty in the practicality. Uh, it's an extraordinarily ex efficient use of the space. Um, it's multi-purpose. Much of the design um, provides for that. And I you know, echo everybody's sentiments, but I am just delighted. It will no longer look like it, it is a continuation of 23rd Street through this park. It is a human scale walkway, not a roadway um, as it currently is. Um, and the only thing I regret about the design is that it doesn't eliminate entirely the West Side Highway. Um, so <laughs> um, really just my question about the, the width of the, um, the gate. And then we might not have it specifically, but you said construction could begin in 2021. It, what do we think? Is this an 18, 24 month um, uh, package once we've got shovels in the ground? Well, it's, um, we think all construction from start to finish is like about a year and a half. But okay. I don't want to give the impression that the entire park will take a year and a half to build. We're, we're going to do one piece, open another, and, and, and try and inconvenience people as little as possible. Yeah, play puzzle. Mm -hmm. Uh, to answer your question about the width, um, uh, it's around 17 feet wide. That's fairly... That's you know, fairly wide. Okay. Um, Sarah, I just saw your hand to go up. Yeah, just a quick follow-up question. Given the... Um, first of all, I think this is a beautiful design, so thank you again for all the work you clearly put into this. Um, given the response you just had on the construction time, would you envision or have you thought about this yet? Like if COVID is still, you know, as big of an issue as it has been in our community and the need for social distancing is still very intense, would, would you consider delaying beginning this effort at all so that that open space would still remain available to members of the community who might need to use it for exercise or to have again more space um, to access the outdoors in a safe manner? I don't think we would slow down the bidding of it, but we would mm -hmm. probably make that decision when we when we get to it. So yeah, this is a little ahead of the game. I was just curious, given that length of construction time, when the park would effectively be off limits. That's that's a good question, um, and I, I can say we would definitely consider that before we put shovel to ground, for sure, as we do with our current construction projects. You know. It's mm -hmm. Noreen, and I'm sorry, I'm. Late, I know, Noreen. But one of the factors um, um, in Delaying construction is likely increased construction costs. The longer yep. you delay, the more it costs. So um, mm -hmm. that is a, a prime reason why if there is money, it is in a lot of people's interest to kind of get it done while mm -hmm. we can. So, I mean, that's, I think, a principal reason for Kevin's initial response. Mm -hmm. I can totally appreciate it. I was just curious if this was on your radar, which I imagine is in it some is capacity. Totally on our radar. Thank you, Sarah. Um, a question in the Q&A regarding the material um, of the flooring of the dog run. Can, do, we, do you have a proposal of what that's going to be? There's concerns. Many of our dog runs are asphalt, um, which is not good for puppy paws. And is it a soft material? Um, and do we know specifically what material it might be? We haven't definitively determined what material it would be. Um, I would say that we would we're thinking we would consider asphalt, but if we used asphalt, we would do some type of color coding on it, which is a, um, you know, makes it a smoother, like steel type surface. So I understand the question about asphalt can be rough. Uh, it really depends on what that top course is like. And ideally you wouldn't want it to be black because that's going to absorb heat and not reflect heat. So we're still going to consider it, uh, consider certain options around that. Um, we basically, we, we've had a lot of positive feedback from the Tribeca dog run area and, and the area right outside, just north of Pier 40, uh, which is exactly what Terry is talking about. It's, it's asphalt underlayment, but it has a seal coat on top of it to make it a little smoother and definitely cooler. Um, so um, that's what we're planning on doing. Um, but again, we'd be interested in hearing any comments. I'll, I'll add that prior to those treatments, particularly at Leroy, we used to get a lot of complaints about the dog run surface. And now I can't remember the last time I got a complaint about the dog run surface at Leroy. 
Is Lee and Leroy is newer than Tribeca, the the Pier Forty one, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the other item that's been raised um, around Alan's point of having there be some kind of commingling of the large and small dog space. Um, as a small dog owner, this is kind of alarming to me. Um, I really appreciate there being separate spaces um, for my dog that doesn't live with other big dogs and some big dogs not recognizing the strength um, that they have uh, over little dogs. So the convertible proposal is interesting. Um, if there's a, a way to have them, um, Jean, your comment in the Q&A um, is, is perhaps useful, um, but I would raise a major flag on it being just um, one dog run as opposed to, to two. Any other um, committee comments? Zazzle, you're here. Do you have anything to add or questions uh, or concerns to raise? Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, it's Zazel. And, Zazel, um, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but thank, thank you, everyone, um, for the extremely exciting um, presentation. Uh, and thank you for putting the picnic area near the playground, which I think is genius. And um, we definitely need uh, umbrellas or some kind of shade component um, so people can be there in all kinds of weather. Thank you, David, for addressing lighting. Um, lighting in the park, uh, it could be subtle, but it has to be everywhere because we've had instances of uh, plant thievery. Um, and hopefully this will not happen again, but we've had many rose bushes stolen and other plants over a certain period of time. I was also uh, remembering Jeffrey had mentioned an open space uh, for gatherings or functions. And I presume that's on the 23rd and 11th Avenue side. Is that, is that still part of the uh, plan? It seemed like an open space would be considered more of the lawn area which yeah, is sort okay. of proposed as taking up the what is now kind of the, the middle plaza space, I would think. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, I know this is down the line, but the, is there a, a maintenance plan for the comfort station? And is it self-cleaning? Um, will there be a monitor there? Or I'm just worried about the maintenance and uh, who goes in and out. Well, the, so, uh, go ahead. Um, just start on um, the statement that I cannot imagine that we'll be able to afford a monitor for the comfort yes, station. Yes, I, I imagine so. Um, and also that there is no comfort station that is self-cleaning. Um, throughout the park, um, we have um, comfort stations are cleaned several times a day depending on the season um, and the use. And I'm expecting that the maintenance protocol would be similar to what we do at other locations, unless something radically changes in terms of budget pros or cons. Um, but um, you know, the, it's important to have materials and fixtures that are that require as little maintenance as possible. Um, I mean, people steal toilet seats. Um, people do, you know, do a lot of things that you would be surprised at. Um, and so having as robust a structure and every single piece of it in, inside is as important to our team as it will be to you. And that's very much something that we look at with the design team as we're building structures. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Sure thing, Dave. Good. Glad, glad you joined us. Thank you. Um, any other um, comments? I don't see any other hands from the public or uh, we've, we've addressed the issues in the Q&A. Um, it, it does sound like considering some of the comments, um, uh, we are seeking a little bit of change. We might want to bundle this up in a letter. Um, head nods, do we think a letter is appropriate here um, considering some of the issues that have been raised? Um, so we um, are looking for perhaps a widening or a reconfiguration of the gate um, and entry uh, to the field regarding the comfort station. Um, analyzing seating and making it perhaps both seating for, for individual experiences as well as um, the, the group seating, um, the harvest table. Um, what a beautiful look that was. Um, I particularly like Blake's point um, of making sure that the plantings 
um, which you guys I think you guys described as a berm, uh, make it so that folks have to stay on the path and they won't end up, you know, trekking through the lawn and having there be a, a path of dirt as opposed to lawn. Um, explore the idea of a convertible um, or sort of convertible dog area um, for co-mingling. Did I miss anything there? Yes. <laughs> Don't forget the bike rack. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. <laughs> um, and bike parking. Anything else? Uh, okay. Jeffrey, yeah. Uh, uh, yep. Maybe a reconsideration or a reconfiguration of the seating inside the dog uh, park instead of the stadium seating. Thank you, Alan. You, I forgot. I didn't. I didn't start writing right i started it right after you said that so the reconfiguration of reconsider the stadium seating actually um, as a dog as a dog owner and a frequent dog parker I, 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 we like stadium seating a lot because we find it very easily accessible to go up and down or but i mean i i think that's six and one half dozen in the other yeah so i just uh, if we can get clarification on that like it, is it is like should it just be two tiers or no tiers and you just want regular regular benches because I, I do know it's a popular uh, mm. style of seating in other dog runs. So I just like to confirm on that. You know, I think, I think perhaps maybe two tiers. I think maybe that might be a better idea rather than, I think, I think folks can control uh, the amount of dog activity on those stairs. If there's only two, I think that's a possibility. I'm just, I'm just concerned. Number one, um, for uh, the dogs running up and down um, when there may not be that many people sitting there. If there's a lot of folks sitting on the, on the steps, then that might prevent the dogs from thinking, they, you know, this is just another dog mound. Um, and uh, I could see dogs tumbling down, hurting themselves. Maybe with, with two, it might be a little bit easier, uh, might be a, a, a better plan. Uh, because it doesn't seem like there's room for a lot of other seating since you have you know the water the water feature up on the north end there which there was seating there before and you don't have any seating on the 11th avenue side so you know yeah that that was my concern about maybe a little more seating if possible um for the dog owners and Jeffrey, if everyone is open to it i would uh state the you know the site locks where the entrances to the comfort station rather than doors what was that what was that david if everyone's comfortable with it i would have uh site locks at rather than doors at the entrances to the comfort station so you go in and you turn a couple of times you don't actually have to touch a door but once you're inside your private mm -hmm. I'd like to mention something about the the benches that we do have. If we could have, um, I'd like to suggest divided benches versus, a, you know, one contiguous bench. Um, at this particular time, uh, it's getting more and more difficult, no matter which park I go to, to find a bench where somebody is not laying across it. Um, so if we can have the separated benches, I, I think that that would serve us better. Proceeding. Uh, Jeffrey, I have a question. This is John from CDR. Um, could you clarify your first comment was regarding the opening of the gateway? Um, I I wouldn't change a thing. I really like it, but you know, I want to reflect the committee's um, interest. I do think 17 feet is very wide. Um, I don't know if folks hearing 17 feet, if people feel more comfortable with that idea. And I would, I would also um, recall that there are more than one entrance to the field. If I'm not mistaken, there was another entrance to the field just a bit further west than the, um, the comfort station was. And then again, uh, to the north um, from 24th Street. Right. Um, so I really like it, but there was concern from the committee. So I, I guess I'm, I'm going back to the committee to see when you guys hear 17 feet, does that allay some of the causes, the concern that you had raised? Yes. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> so I just want to I, chime I, I in. I love that. I'll just chime in quickly. It's 17 feet at kind of the smallest point, but it does open up to about 22 feet. Um, there's also a gate that 
uh, CDR has designed as part of the comfort station to be able to secure the field, secure the comfort station simultaneously. So just, I think there were some other concerns, but um, you know, for your consideration, that's also been, been designed as part of this comfort station. Uh, I would also add that that gate is designed to basically be where the solar panels end, which is porous. So we're not creating a uh, shade or a rain canopy after hours for people to camp out in either. It's, it, um, there's no protection area for somebody to camp out and it'll be secured, which is probably a, a concern also. People may have. Okay. Jeffrey, I, I'd like to include uh, maximizing solar collection. And That's right. Thank you. Maximize use of solar and consider it for other lighting in the park, not just power of the bathroom. Protecting the mature tree if possible. Jeffrey, if I can ask uh, just one last thing. In regards, to, in regards to the seating, so we have the picnic area, and then I recall you had seating coming in off of 11th Avenue. There's like a row of seating uh, along, along uh, the, the, the pathway. Is there other you know, scattered seating throughout in some of the other areas? Or is, is that, because uh, I didn't notice on the plans that there were like you know, little scattered tables, chairs. No, is that, it really is not. Is that an idea in order to keep people in the area, sitting, using the, using the area as a place to come and sit and, you know, instead of eating at the picnic area, maybe, uh, you know, the small tables, people coming from work just want to grab a sandwich, sit down at a small table somewhere. Is that a, does that fit into the scheme of things or would it? I mean, it could. We looked at some options um, that would better accommodate that. Um, but it, it, it sort of meant increasing paved areas. And uh, we understood that that was less desirable, generally speaking, to the community. So um, I, I think it's something that maybe the trust should respond to about how they see it operating as well. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of luck to, if you look throughout the park, we've had the cafe type seating is concentrated and we have bench seating elsewhere. And that's not to say you can't eat a sandwich on the bench, but the cafe style seating is centrally located, which helps us um, maintain it. So it's not scattered throughout the park, it's concentrated. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, I don't think we mentioned this, but we're also putting in security cameras in the park also. Um, uh -huh. we, can, we can monitor certain areas. So, mm -hmm. so this area in particular, would be monitored than others at the picnic area. Uh, so this design has the concentrated kind of tabletop eating area in one spot, which is the, the picnic area. But then there are also benches all along the south side of that windy central path. Right. I think there's, I want to say there's almost 20, 20 benches. Uh, okay. Which is pretty significant. Okay. Kevin, <laughs> Kevin those, uh, those monitors, are they live? Are they uh, being watched? They're not going to be watched yeah. live, or are they? They're, the watched. they're, they're watched. Oh, yeah, a lot. Oh, okay. yep. they'll be watched live, but that doesn't mean that someone can get there the moment something happens. So, you know, so all of your questions about sight lines and everything else like that matter because it's a long park. Got it. Um, just on the benching factor, I love conversation chairs, um, and they don't allow for laying down, but they're really. Uh, Distinct, and we don't see those in a lot of our parks, but I think they're quite wonderful. Um, just to throw that out as an option. Um, anything else? Um, put, it in the, put it in the letter. Thank you. Um, on that, I think we've clarified on the benches to have additional and have sections. Thank you for that, Sally. There is a concern that too much space is being designated to small dogs, but I'm not sure we know a census of large and small dogs in Chelsea specifically so as to, to I don't know, to unequivocally state that, um, especially if we're going to consider uh, finding it to be a convertible space in some manner or another, um, which I think would be a first of its kind and could be interesting. Um, so okay, I just wanted, to, sorry to interrupt, but I, I no, just, please, Kevin. We, we thought quite a bit about convertible space and, and talked this amongst our operations people. It's really difficult to to police that, for lack of a better term. Um, so we really weren't comfortable having a, a gate that some dog owners could open and they want their dogs to play with each other and other dog owners don't. 
it creates a point of conflict. I'm not saying it's impossible, and we, we definitely want your point of view on this, but we thought operationally, it's, it's a really difficult thing to implement. Yeah. I, 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 will say I would agree with, with, with Kevin, but I think when we, when we spoke, we thought perhaps when you configure the, the fencing, that if down the road you found that the small dog space was underused, at some point in time, you could you could bring that into the large dog run, but not to. I make guess I just wonder if you if you're comfortable with your small dog being with big dogs, you just put your small dog in the big dog run area, and that protects those who are not necessarily comfortable with their small dog mingling with big dogs off a leash. Right, but then you need more space in the large area, so I I think what what we talked about was some way to not make the conversion back, you know converting back uh, uh, the, the large dog run uh, uh, a problem if, uh, if it's just a matter of changing the gating at some point, a year from now, two years from now, you say, oh, you know, we're not really getting that much activity in the small dog run, let's get the space over. I think that's what we were sort of uh, hinting at at that, at that meeting, but definitely not to make it where, oh, I want to go into this one now and I'll close the gate and come back, and that wasn't a, a, a viable uh, uh, alternative. Noreen, were you going to add something a moment ago? I was going to make the same point you just did. Um, but, but I also think that, um, I mean, I, I think we can look more at the gate system for sure. Um, and I get what you're saying, Alan. Thank you for the clarification. I, I do think that um, dog ownership trends change over time. People, you know, different dogs become more popular or not. So, you know, I, I think that um, the, the basic um, principle of like what kind of dogs do people have now might not be the same answer in five years and so on. So, you know, I, I think that you're basically asking for flexibility as much as possible, which is, I think, something that we can try to look at. Um, um, but I think that, you know, we'll never know exactly what the right mix is probably for this question. Scarlett agrees. And could somebody call the question? Or actually, could somebody make a motion so I can call the question? Marty, thank you. Write a letter a incorporating everything you said. Absolutely. I've typed up half of it already. Whatever, whatever um, else you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, seeing as it's a Zoom meeting, it's easier to ask if there's any objections to the letter as proposed. Uh, abstention or present not eligible. Great. Hearing nothing, that passes unanimously. Thank you to the trust. Um, and Terry and John, this is fantastic. Um, this is really exciting. Um, yeah, so thank you all. Um, with that, I want to move into the next um, item of the meeting, which was something raised by Brett um, a month and a half or two months ago. And we recently talked about um, the Chelsea Park um, additions that he was looking for. And he also wanted to talk through um, underutilized public space along um, Hudson River Park and specifically the Greenway. He's not here this evening, so I'm gonna summarize what I understand to be his concerns. Um, this slide shows Chelsea Piers. Um, if those of you are familiar with it, um, you know West Side Highway, well, along those trees, there's the Greenway, and then there's three lanes of roadway for access points um, to Chelsea Piers. I think if we jump to the next slide, Janine, it zooms in a little bit. There we go. Um, so on the right, West Side Highway, the picture is taken from the Greenway, and to the left, you can see um, Chelsea Piers and the Access Road. Let's see the next slide. Again, this is showing you the space um, in front of Chelsea Piers that's dedicated to, I believe, use of the, spear, uh, the piers. Erica, I know I think you're here still, so we'll definitely bring you over for this discussion once we're in the point of it. Um, and Noreen, you're here as well. Um, but Brett wanted to bring all this up because we have been, um, you know, looking at more ways to create space for the greenway, for pedestrians, um, generally speaking. Um, you know, the board sent a letter along with boards one and two asking for a lane of the West Side Highway as a means to expand more space for the greenway and pedestrian space. And he identified this location um, and then another location to the north on the next slide, if you want to jump to Janine, thank you, um, along uh, the cruise ship terminal. Um, here, this is uh, in Hell's Kitchen, um, Piers 88, 90, and 92. Next slide, just north of the Intrepid. And you can see here, um, 
that wall on the left makes it uh, extremely dangerous for pedestrians. Um, and this all came out of um, security concerns post 9-11 um, and an a, a unfulfilled promise from a developer to create more public space within the terminal as well. Um, so he's not here to elaborate on it, but I did want to have the, the, a bit of a discussion this evening, given the trust presence and Erica being here. Um, and, you know, Noreen, I'm not sure if you want to share anything from the start um, on this. And Erica, are you here? Uh, yes, you are. OK. <laughs> um, so let's start at Chelsea Piers. Um, you know, it was flagged because there's three lanes of roadway there that Brett saw as being very underused and would love to hear from you um, an explanation of that roadway, um, what it's utilized for, um, and how you see that space. Um, well, if you scroll back to the photos, um, uh, like the next one, yeah, uh, this is when we were closed. This is during COVID. So this is not a very accurate depiction of what the roadway looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the, we have, the studios were all dark because the, the state had shut them down. All the facilities were dark. All of the businesses were dark. So um, I am more than happy to send along photos of during operations what this roadway would traditionally look like. Um, Law and Order and the studios have trucks on this roadway that service their film studios. The boats and all of the shipping have cruises that are coming in and out. The businesses, the golf driving range is already reopened, which has generated some business already and activity. And hopefully by the end of July, COVID pending and how that plays out, these, this will become operational again. There are more than 2,000 people who are employed and work at Chelsea Piers. And that doesn't include the guests and visitors. There have been multiple studies demonstrating a lack of confidence, like Pew and Quinnipiac both, both put out studies noting a lack of confidence in public transportation. So I think our Traditional traffic, which was very reliant on the bus and subways, may actually turn a little bit more to vehicular traffic. Um, so, can you explain? So, it's, we see three lanes here. Can you explain um, the structure and use of the lanes? Uh, they are passed through, and a lot of it also eliminates queuing on the West Side Highway because there's a small queuing space before the turn off at 24th Street. And so if it backs up at that intersection at the north end of the complex where pedestrians, bikes, and cars, and buses all interact, that is a stop. And we have a person there posted that actually directs traffic. Everybody's probably seen him or her. That person will stop traffic to prevent collisions and to keep things going as smoothly as possible. When that happens, the queue before it backs up onto the West Side Highway is not that great. Um, so these lanes also help assist in through traffic when there are events, boat cruises, the studios are operational and shooting episodes of Law and & Order um, and, and customers, as well as employees coming and going to and from work. It's a, a pretty large number of employees that work in this area. Okay. Um, um, so, so you'll frequently have in the most eastern lane or on the left of the screen, frequently yep. you'll have some, you know, if a, of a school is dropping off, if a, the studio is doing something. If it's a school, it will drop off on the sidewalk side, although I don't know if we'll have school again, but <laughs> let's hope. I don't want to go back to teaching high school. Um, they would drop off on the curbside, clearly, so the kids don't have to cross the street. So that would then stop traffic there. If it's a studio, you know, whether it's a production truck unloading, whether they were off shooting in Washington Square Park, a murder or what have you, they would be unloading their equipment and that would be on the eastern side of that roadway. And so that, in effect, would eliminate one of those two lanes temporarily, but the problem is it would then back up onto the highway. Um, 
I, as I say, I'm happy to send photos of what this looks like when it's actually operational versus closed. Okay. And then there's a third lane. Is that just sort of another use if the other two are blocked up to sort of provide? And through lane for Uber, for Lyft, for taxis, for all kinds of through traffic. If you come here on a night prior to COVID, you will find you could wait 10 minutes just to get out through the traffic light on the south end. It will be completely blocked and we will have four traffic people along this roadway helping to get the, you know, the person who hops out in the middle of everything out of their Uber, just like we see all over New York. who's just like, I'm getting out right here. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, they start unloading. You have that all along this roadway, just like any city, any street in New York. So okay. it also is the queuing space for emergency vehicles and police and ambulances and all that sort of thing, fire trucks. Sure. I mean, this comes about for a number of reasons, not just identifying the need for additional public space, but that is a really sharp S curve um, on the Greenway. Um, I couldn't that sort agree of, more. We I'm are sorry? Not I could not agree with you more on the north end. We yes. are very much against that curve. We always have been. We've been very vocal about it. It it actually is straighter than it once was. Right. It used to be you had to slow down or you would just fly right off the and the design where it was in pot, when it was a real S was functional because everyone slowed down. So a conflict mm -hmm. was not at a high speed. And a high speed conflict is always worse than a slow, a slow speed con conflict. We were completely against it being straightened. It's now much more a very smooth that you can take at 20, 30 miles an hour. And sure. we, we are not a fan of that, but we, that's state DOT, that's not us. Sure. Um, we also should note that there is a huge indoor and outdoor walkway that is very popular on the water that we maintain, we have planters, we have benches, we welcome people. We don't like skateboarders because they tend to, the boards flip out and hit people. But if you're biking, if you're not racing biking, you can be on that. It's, so there is another pedestrian walk area that I have to get the footage, but I'm, I'm guessing it's probably 30, 35 feet wide. And one part of it is covered and so if it's raining, it's, oh, you know, the garage doors go up, but you don't get rained on. And one part of it is outside. So there is that also that runs north, south, and then the tips of the piers are all open um, that you can also walk. So in terms of separating bikes and pedestrians or strollers or little kids, um, they all tend to go over there because the kids like the bikes and looking in the water and all kinds of stuff. So they already um, are over on that area. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I see some hands. David, let's start with you. Uh, you know, it still is free lane. And, you know, I've been there before COVID and there are a lot of times when it's largely empty and it's right adjacent to a lot of interior parking. I just wonder if, you know, there isn't a, a more resourceful approach that couldn't, have, couldn't find some way of making this more available to the public. I think that's what we want to either think about, suggest, talk through, um, and see. I think it'll be useful um, for Erica to provide additional pictures, recognizing that obviously it's not 24 seven that way. Um, but that's, thank you. We want, we want to have the conversation. Um, anything else on that, David? Um, Eric, could you tell us if any of that interior parking space could be given over to, say, the law and order vehicles? Uh, they are in there, and they have a lot of um, employees also park in there. Uh, the right. so parking uh, is used by them. The trucks can't, you know, can't fit. Um, it would they're too long for parking places, and you also have to the, where they could perhaps park is the very tip, but then that eliminates fire truck access which is a violation. They have to be able to make a turn at the end of each pier, a fire truck. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, hi, Erica. Um, thank you for your offer to share some additional photos. Do you guys also actually track data on you know, the number of cars that are coming through, on the number of emergency vehicles, number of school buses? 
Like, yeah. Do you have any of that information you could share with us? Because yes. again, you know, photos are going to be very different, right? Right. At different times. Yeah. Yes, we do have data and traffic studies. And David, who unfortunately, he doesn't usually go to community meetings and he didn't realize how long they run. <laughs> so he had not allocated <laughs> adequate time. He was like, we're still at item one. I was like, you didn't bring dinner? It was a big item one this evening. So apologies <laughs> for that. It was a big one for us. Um, um, but he did, he, he indicated that we do have data and studies and information that we can share you know, prior to COVID. The, all the COVID data is going to be, you know, completely different. Right. Yeah. If you have any of that data you could share with us, that would be very helpful and to us having an informed discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you, right. Sarah. Uh, Sally? Sally, you're muted. muted. Sally, you're muted. Sally. Okay. Sorry about go. that. Okay. I have the little screen. Okay. I don't know if you were going to bring this up, but the S curve reminded me um, of the point that I had brought up uh, when Brett made these, um, these uh, observations was the stanchions that came to be in the bike lanes, um, I guess, around 9-11 or to keep cars off of the bike lanes. Um, I find them... Um, I mean, I ride the area all the time. And when you have, to, I slow down to go through those stanchions. And because of the electric bikes and the speed bikers, when you, they come, they, they come to those stanchions and they, they cut you off to go through, they go around them. I just think they're dangerous. I know that they serve a purpose. And I had proposed the question, is there another way to situate them that that they'll, they'll protect as they've been designed to protect, but that we won't have to go through that narrow passageway when the bike is bike when the bike lanes are crowded, um, the people coming up around you, uh, you know, at 30 miles an hour, are just cutting you off. I, I don't know if there's any information on accidents that have occurred because of them, but I f I find them very intimidating. Um, I mean, Noreen is the expert on these, but the um those were put in, I mean, I haven't been on the bikeway now in a few months, but those were put, I've, we're talking about those huge barricades. They were put in after the um, terrorist. Right. I know, I know what the function, I know what the function is, right. And I'm just asking if they can be repositioned, solve, yes. still solve the problem, but prevent everybody having to come into this narrow, and it, there are so many of them. So it's constantly yes. happening and you have all these racing bikers and now electric bikes and uh, just shoving you through that, pushing you through that area uncomfortably. I couldn't agree more. I run on that and I am all, I, I'm always trying to get to the water at any juncture when it's shared because it is narrow. But I mean, Noreen can talk to this. I believe it's um, state, it's a combination of state DOT and uh, Homeland Security or somebody, Doreen, right? Isn't this out of all of our jurisdiction? Or counterterror, NYPD counterterrorism it might be. Yeah, so it's one of those uh, security groups. So, so this is after this was um, a few years ago, not after September 11th, when the um, terrorists drove down the bikeway south right. of 40 and killed many people. Um, the, almost instantaneously after that, the state, the city, counterterrorism, like every every agency, um, basically decided within within a matter of two days, there were temporary barriers, concrete barriers put in. And then the State Department of Transportation is who has been installing the current system. Um, my understanding is that all of those agencies collectively looked at um, the smallest vehicle size that could possibly fit between certain gaps. And believe it or not, there are some very small ones. They also looked at the footings, all kinds of other things like that. So um, frankly, um, we cannot control this. I will say that we report um, accidents and other things when we find out about them um, to um, the state so that they are aware of the situation. I think they're probably, you know, balancing different forms of risk in, in making this decision. I, I do think that um, to the extent the community has observations about particularly 
um, dangerous ones or you know whatever, I think it's always worth your making that known to um, people besides us. Um, because I think that your eyes are on the, the, this area, you know, more than maybe some people's. Um, but really, it's not something that we can control. I would suggest, you know, I, I, and I, I appreciate that, and I, I definitely understand it, but I, I also believe that something you just said, um, and I, I, of course, remember when the cars came on and how horrific that was, but there was an immediate response to putting something down to protect bikers and pedestrians, which is what they did. And I'm just wondering if when they put them down, they really thought about the design or just wanted to put something down there to protect us. So the question that I'm raising is I, I definitely realize we need something. Um, and if you have any input at all, can they look at it to see if there's a better place to arrange them and put them so that they, they satisfy what they would put there for without creating a hazard zone, which I, and again, Sorry, I have no one. That's me? a request that we can, we can make that request. It would uh -huh. not go to the trust. Um, it would go to, uh, like we mentioned, state DOT, and I believe NYPD counterterrorism, and whatever state authority oversees uh -huh. that as well. I, I think it's a completely separate item. Okay. Um, but it's something we can certainly um, opine on because I find it just, you know, so offensive that, you know, I think we're three or four years later and they still have just sugar cubes um, all along the greenway. Imagine if they dropped sugar cubes on a highway, the, you know, how <laughs> ballistic people would go. Um, excuse me, not people, car drivers would go. So, um, yes, a separate item. Happy Thank to entertain. You. Okay. Um, that as well. I've been um, heard. Okay. <laughs> any other, um, Alan, I saw your hand up a second ago. Um, did we allay that concern? I wasn't concerned. I was just trying, uh, the, the question about who runs the, uh, the bikeway was answered uh, in terms of that. And I believe the stanchions are primarily at the entrance ways where people do cross coming from the east side of the highway into the park. And if the stanchions uh, help slow down the traffic uh, on the bikeway, I think that's a good thing. They're, they don't. They, they are placed completely out of the way of cars, actually. Set I'm, not, very I'm, much. Not, I'm not talking about the cars. I'm talking about the stanchions are in the bikeway, basically, right? So if bikers, and it, it's not every biker because some are just going to keep going as fast as they are, but thank you, Sally, for slowing down. And, and, <laughs> and, the, and the stanchions help people cross that bikeway because some people will slow down because they have to maneuver around the stanchions. But that's all. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Leslie? I just had or, a question, Erica. Sure. Um, the, I've walked along that waterway that you're yeah. talking about. It's great. It's, it's, it's really, is there a natural entry and exit point from the greenway to there? So people, do you know what I mean? So yes. the bike yes. can go around. And so we don't even have to worry about this. This might be a non, uh, if they have the, the pathway back there or is, or is that a totally isolated area? Oh no, it's, I mean, it's a huge walkway right along the huts and it comes right out of the uh, Lyndon Miller Gardens on the north end. So if you come straight along, if you just stick along the water, it just goes directly onto so you, the- you would, If you're coming, if you're going north, uh, north, you would veer off left, obviously, and go behind. If you are coming north and you're on your like in front of your 57 where it gets right. really wide over there between 57 yes. and 59, you can turn onto the dock and there's a double big double door and you just go right through there and you're onto it. Or you could go around the whole perimeter if you want a more scenic route, the path all connects. Right. Or you can drive into the uh, parking lot and just go in right there down the, the road. So Jeffrey, it. if we have a big space there, isn't it just directing people left or right instead of, do you know what I mean? If, isn't it just kind of more traffic, bicycle and pedestrian traffic? Well, the yeah, I think it's a combination. I mean, the, the pedestrian area is very separate from, you know, it's very much, it's on the Western, far on the other side of this, you can't see it from here. There's no connection for the greenway to that pedestrian area. Um, that's what I, I don't know that that's what we're advocating for. It's but, really just identifying as much space as we can, as, as much as we asked for the lane of the West Side Highway, we recognize that's going to be difficult. And I think Brett's, uh, you know, visualization was, well, what's all this space? Is it necessary? And, you know, I don't, I don't 
mean for any of this to be an attack on the operations of uh, Chelsea Piers because they're um, critical, integral, and essential to the functions of the city. Um, but I think that the whole, everybody as a whole is looking at how best can we reanalyze the space that we've long accommodated um, for cars to use uh, for production purposes or just through traffic. Um, and is there a way that we could make this more efficient? Um, I don't know, but that might be one of the things that um, we sort of request. And I don't know that we can do that without a better understanding of the data, but I think the whole point of this conversation was to really just start it, begin to understand what this space is used for um, and what might be done differently um, to make it more, to make it safer and more public accommodating. Yeah, there's also, and you'll see in this photo on the right side, a sidewalk that I don't know how many feet, that's pretty wide. Um, yep. As a runner, I mean, I traditionally end at Chelsea Piers, but yeah. that is a I very, wonder why. I know, <laughs> gotta take a shower. <laughs> um, but that is a very popular, you'll find people, there are runners who run on the bikeway. And I know they're not, they're supposed to be on the other section. There are runners on the bikeway. In this area of the park, I find the runners are on this sidewalk. Um, because I, so they tend to, as you get to the north end or the south end of our complex, the runners veer onto this walkway, the bikers veer onto the, the left, the eastern side, the runners are on that sidewalk, and everybody with a stroller or something has meandered over to the, um, to the water side usually. Traditionally, that's the traffic pattern we see, and I have studied it because I use the bikeway and I run, so I'm moving slower than the bikers. So I have plenty of time to look around. Um, and I've worked there for 18 years, so 19 sure. years, so. Well, I, what I, I don't, if the committee indulges me, I don't want to take any action on this this evening considering Eric is willing to share photos and some data. And I think that'll be really useful for the next phase of our discussion. Um, mm -hmm. So if everybody's okay with that, that's what I'd like to request at this time of Erica um, for this area in terms of the photos and any data that you can share, we would love to um, take a look at that and continue this conversation probably at our September meeting because like good New Yorkers, we're gonna try to take August off. Uh. Because we haven't been off since March <laughs> sitting, sitting like here. Like we said, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, that would be really helpful if you could share that with us. Um, Absolutely. And we'll distribute that to the committee. Um, okay. Send it to you or to Jean? Uh, if you can send it to Janine, and okay. that way she can share it with the committee, that would be great. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Any other um, comments on this item around Chelsea Piers from the committee? Erica, sorry, okay. I actually have one more quick question. On the um, sure. alternate pedestrian route that you mentioned that's like on Chelsea Piers property, mm -hmm. um, I, I know what you're talking about. I've used it before. It, it's great. Um, I noticed it was locked one of the gates the other night. Can you just confirm, like, are there typical hours when it's open to the public and when? Um, well, I, I am not 100% on our COVID overnight operations. Traditionally, I would have to ask, because um, I haven't been there during COVID. Tradi there is a gate on the north end and the south end. Traditionally, those are always open north-south, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, always open. Mm -hmm. I don't know if during COVID, based on staffing or some other reason, if those two have been closed. I have never seen that happen other than after Sandy. And that was based on safety that we had to, you know, it was flooded. Um, I do know the perimeter walkways. We close the gates traditionally that go out to the very western tips because we have found that activities at night late on those tips is not really very productive um, and it seems unnecessary to leave them open and have sort of bad things happening out there. So we leave them open, usually they're pretty late. Yeah, I think they close them around 10 or something, but then once we get into the wee hours of the night, we have uh, somebody go out and do a perimeter check and close them down just because um, you know, we're finding you know, needles and bottles and things out there that weren't really positive. Right. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just noticed a couple of weeks ago the northern gate was closed and never in my life had I seen that. So that's just why I asked. So that actually seems to gel with what you're saying. Yeah, I can ask. It could have been based, it's, I mean, as I say, I, COVID has created all new rules in every 
where in my life. So <laughs> could be another yes. moment in that. Mm -hmm. um, I know. They were closed during Sandy. I do know that because we were doing massive construction on the rebuilding of the mm -hmm. facilities. And so we had machines and such out there. Um, and sometimes the outer walkway in the dead of winter is closed because there are sloped roofs, roofs. <laughs> and so when it's melting, stuff could slide off. And so we do also sometimes close. If you see a perimeter closed in the dead of winter, it's so nothing falls on your head, but then the interior walkway is still open because it's protected. Got it. Okay, thank you. Sorry for butting in, Jeffrey. Thank you. For Not that. at all. Don't worry. That was important. Um, thank you, Erica, um, for, for being here and talking us through this. And we look forward to sort of continuing the conversation with a better understanding. Um, thanks. Um, the, the next um, discussion is going to be short and sweet. And I'm doing it for two reasons. It's 830. And also because unfortunately, EDC, um, who has jurisdiction over the cruise ship terminal, um, could not attend this evening, even though Janine and her good due diligence um, invited the agency and they uh, said they couldn't make it, um, which is ironic since we go to these meetings from home. Um, but it's a really difficult situation because Homeland Security has identified the site as being um, a target for terrorism. And so it's really treated sort of airport style impenetrable, but it makes it extremely dangerous um, for pedestrians that are just looking to go north from basically the Intrepid to get to Clinton Cove, to get to Riverside Park, and you know, who wanna stay within um, the confines of the Greenway and ideally, you know, in Hudson River Park. So if we can go back a slide, is it? Let's see, yeah, this is just, I mean, the glaring example, um, the person with the dog on the far left. I mean, even the dog recognizes that it has to walk single file. Um, so I would, I would like to send, um, a curt letter to EDC um, expressing our, you know, being upset that they couldn't attend this evening to really give us some, some of the facts as to why this is this way and um, send a note to our electeds uh, requesting um, uh, sort of a push on this as to why it is that for almost um, 20 years now, um, there's what, four or five feet of, uh, of access way there. Um, and I won't fold this into the Vornado issue around the promised public space from them, but I do think it's worth it to shake our, um, to shake EDC and to flag it for our elected officials. Um, any questions um, from the committee or the public on this one? So with that, Sally, would you like to make a motion on your, um, Greenway Jeffrey, Bollard. Jeffrey, I think Noreen had her. Uh, oh, Noreen, I'm here. sorry. Could I you can't go see to everybody the at the moment. Slide, Janine, I just want to show you all something um, that Jeffrey is just which, talking about. Which forward, Noreen? Or, uh, I think, think the one before this, when you were first showing the area. I think it's the one Let's before see. this slide. The, the, the site plan with the piers? No, maybe it's after. Sorry. Yeah, the site plan. There uh, we go. Yeah, so I just wanted to kind of point out, I think what you were kind of saying here. So um, way back when I probably oh, worked for Community Board 4, I don't know, um, <laughs> uh, um, the area kind of near the loop um, between the Intrepid and um, Pier 88, um, and then continuing on throughout there, the state um, actually built that water sidewalk way um, as a pedestrian path. And then September 11th happened and MARSEC levels happened and everything that you just said, Jeffrey, I think is accurate in terms of like the this treating it like an airport. Um, but one thing that you might want to maybe um, Congressman Nadler or someone would be helpful for explaining like what does MARSEC level mean in this day and age at this point? And are there nuances of MARSEC levels um, just for um, anybody? Like, you know, is there ever greater access or, or just really because this is um, effectively a major transportation facility? Is it kind of all or nothing from the, from the federal transportation perspective? That might be a good kind of gatekeeping question just to understand for context. Because I do think that it's like, I think this area is subject to MARSEC levels just the same way as like an airport is. I, I 
yes, I think that's part of the, the struggle we have here. Um, but I think that's a really great place to start um, to really begin to understand it. Um, any other questions or comments about this one? Okay, um, Janine, would you mind um, closing out the presentation so I can see the committee again in terms of all the Hollywood squares of WPE? Um, so, uh, Sally, would you like to make a motion on your Bollard letter for the Greenway? I think you said, yes, I'd like to make a motion. Yes, I would like to make a, a motion. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second on Sally's motion um, with regards to requesting? Perfect. I'll, I'll second it. And, you know, I hate those things, too, and they're too close together. It's not a matter of I've actually witnessed accidents caused by them. You know, it's not a that, that they make you slow down too much. It's that they are hazardous, especially for people who just started riding a bike there. And there are a ton of them. So I wish that they could rethink them and maybe spread them farther apart. Thank you, Consider David. the design. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think, again, they were just put there to save us without thinking about the best way to do it. Yep. Um, any objections to this letter? Present not eligible or abstention? The squeaking is scarlet, but I'm, I, you know, I'm going to vote in favor of the letter. Um, so hearing none of that, well, that letter passes unanimously. Um, and then with regards to the public space along the Manhattan cruise ship terminal, um, would somebody be willing to propose a motion uh, for a, perhaps a letter to EDC, expressing our dismay and upsetness that they couldn't come this evening and our concerns of the lack of public access to the space, and then separately um, a note to our elected um, regarding this as well. I, I can't make the motion. I get the EDC here for other reasons as well. We, we want to do this cruise ship. My, my electric power. Yep, <laughs> I hear you. They have to uh, come in front of us for, I think, a few things, right? Yeah. They don't have to, but should. So, Leslie, can I take that comment as your motion on these two letters? No, I'm not right. You want me to write two letters? No, 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 just the oh, motion. Motion. And I'll oh, second oh, sorry, it. Sorry. I can't make motions as the chair of the meeting right now. So that, you know, I, I, I'm the one moving it along usually. But um, <laughs> so thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Sally. Um, okay. Any questions on that? Objections? Present not available or extend abstentions? Hearing none, that letter passes unanimously. Um, any new business or old business? Alan? I should, I mean, I think always, right, Alan? Right. It's not helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually environmental. Um, um, you know, we, we, we have this uh, system in, in New York City of alternate side parking, which has been, you know, here and there the last couple of months. However, as much as alternate side parking helps us clean our streets, it also um, impacts the environment of the people living around there. Because in the wintertime, uh, people are sitting there in their cars for about an hour and a half, running their cars so they can stay warm in the summertime so that they uh, can stay cool. So usually, uh, let's take 22nd Street where I am between 9th and 10th Avenue, it starts at nine o'clock, ends at 10.30. Um, oftentimes the uh, sweeper comes down at 9.15, 9.20, everybody moves back and they sit there till 10.30. Why? Why do they need to sit there till 10.30? Um, I once got a, a response to that from uh, sanitation, and they said, well, maybe the guy wants to come back around again and make sure he cleaned your street properly. So I'm waiting for him to come around two times, but that's never going to happen. So for future reference, and this might fall into a little bit with transportation also because it's you know, obviously the street. So maybe for future discussion or something, we can maybe see about trying to get the city to improve its alternate side, which they've been hammering around with this. So it doesn't matter if it's one day or two days, it still impacts the community. Um, why should people be sitting there? Maybe we can get these street sweepers to have cameras there. So in case somebody is blocking it for some reason, they can ticket the person. But once the sweeper comes by, people should be able to move their car back and go home and get on with their lives. I think it's a great point, Alan, and it speaks to the efficiencies as a whole that we need to be making um, right. as a city. I'd be happy to raise it uh, to the transportation committee, which I think it would make a bit more sense coming out of, but they could recognize that 
it was requested by their colleagues on WPE as it relates to the environment, if you'd like. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's a great idea. And I notice as a cyclist that often the people who are waiting are blocking a bike lane too. Thank you for that, Alan. Um, anything else from anybody? Well, um, with that, I thank you all for being here this evening. Um, and continue to stay safe um, and try to enjoy the summer as we have it. Our full board is at the end of this month, and then we will not be meeting um, in August. We reconvene oh. the beginning of September for a full board meeting and restart our regular schedule on the first Thursday of the month um, thereafter. Um, so it's nice to see you all. Thank you. Good meeting, Jay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mon. Thank you. Bye, guys. <clears throat> Thank you, Janine. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat>